And if you would take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And as we get there, we're going to remind us that we are looking at Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. And uh, I know some of you are wondering where our verses went because normally we have our verses that we go through every Sunday, but because of the length of, of what we're dealing with, I, I needed to make some room. And some of you are shaking in your seats now because I said length of what we're dealing with and you think we're going to be here all day. It's not true, just most of it. Okay, because I've got to be out of here by 510. Um, Texas Tech and Arkansas are playing. And uh, you know I'm from Arkansas. We're from Arkansas, so I grew up rooting for the Razorbacks. And so I was a little disappointed uh, uh, the Magahas uh, mentioned Arkansas today because that's where Stumo began. It's actually in the city where my, my sister-in-law lives. Um, and uh, they didn't say who pig suey when they mentioned Arkansas, so I was a little offended. So guns up, woo, pig, suey. That's what I'm going to be doing today. I don't, you know, I got to, I got to cheer for both of them, but I'm mainly going to be going for Texas Tech because they got my favorite player. So, you know, I knew you all were really interested in knowing all of that. So, just wanted to share this important information. Okay. If you would, we're going to begin reading in verse 20. So if you would read with me. Daniel writes, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have come now, uh, come forth to give you insight with understanding at the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined." And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that we handle it correctly this morning. Pray that you will help us to grow from what we learn. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. How many of you, a show of hands, okay. How many of you enjoy getting right into the middle of a controversial discussion? You're sick. No. I know my son's back there going, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't like controversy. I don't like uh, conflict. And so, you know, I try to avoid it as much as possible. Sometimes you can't help it. And this is one of those instances. Many Bible scholars will tell us that when we get to this issue of Daniel's 70 weeks, this is one of the most controversial prophecies in all of Scripture. It's one of the most uh, discussed. And, and there are so many different viewpoints. As we've seen going through the book of Daniel, it's not very, uh, th there's not a lot of controversy in the book of Daniel, is there? Yeah, there is. I mean, it's from front to back. Uh, but this is one of the most difficult passages and one of the most discussed, if you will, passages. Well, let me ask you another question before we dig into this. And you don't have to raise your hand, just think about it. Um, have you ever gotten, you're in the middle of some sort of activity or, or, or some sort of event, and it's, it's coming right down to the end, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, thank God, this is almost over. 
and you're just excited it's almost over, only to find out that it's not over, but there's a whole nother part that is yet to come. Have you ever been there? I remember in college, um, coach would say at the end of practice after he's run us ragged, everybody on the line, the most dreaded words in all of basketball. So everybody on the line, so you get on the line, you're dead already. He says, okay, we're gonna do a 30 second line drill, which were killers. We had to make it a whole line drill. For those of you who don't know what a line drill is, it's a, today they call it a suicide. You people are just sick today, call it a suicide. But anyway, we called them line drills. And so we get on the, and we have to do 30 seconds. If you don't make it, you gotta do it again, right? And, um, and so we do a whole series, and he says, okay, we're going to do this many, and then we're done for the day. And so we, we're on the last one, and you're thinking, thank you, God, uh, because what I ate for lunch is not agreeing with me at this point in time. And, and you're thinking, this is the last one, and you run that last line drill, and it's done, right? No, then coach says, hey, Sperlin, get on the free throw line. And everybody knows what's coming, because I never shot over 65% from the free throw, which is not good. Okay, if Sperlin makes two free throws, we're done for the day. If not, we're going to do another line drill. <laughs> Most of the time we did more line drills. So, but you get the picture. You're, you think you're almost done with something, and yet then when you're right there at the end, something else is added to it, right? This is what Daniel's dealing with. Daniel has been, you remember from the, the, verse 1, he's been looking at Jeremiah's prophecies, and he sees that they were promised 70 years of captivity in Babylon because of their negligence to obey God when it came to the sabbatical years, all right? There were 490 years, and God gave them 70 years of discipline. Uh, and Daniel seeing, oh, we're really close. We're two, three years away from having, uh, being able to go back home. And so he's praying, he's confessing his sins, he's confessing the sins of his people, um, and just uh, uh, crying out to God, oh God, because of your great name, uh, will you please do this? And he's just looking forward to this time, and yet what happens is that Gabriel comes along and says, Daniel, you're right. This is my paraphrase, obviously, but Daniel, you're right. That 70 weeks is, uh, 70 years is almost done, but before the kingdom comes, before the promises to Israel are fulfilled, there's another period of time that you have to deal with first. So, I imagine Daniel had some mixed emotions. On the one hand, Gabriel is saying, those promises are going to be fulfilled, but not at this time. Daniel's thinking, hey, we're going to go back to the land. The, the promises are going to be fulfilled. The kingdom is going to come back, and, and maybe the Messiah is going to come. But Gabriel says, not yet, Daniel. There are still some years of discipline that Israel has to face. And so that's what we're looking at today as we're in this section, dealing with the prophetic plan for Israel. And we're looking at the 70 weeks prophecy. We've already looked at Daniel's prayer of repentance in the first 19 verses. And today we're going to begin to look at Gabriel's response to Daniel's prayer. So let's just kind of dive in head first here. We're going to see this is how it's laid out. There's the prologue to the prophecy. There's the purpose of the 70 weeks. And then there's the program of the 70 weeks. And so we're going to be dealing today with this prologue of the prophecy. And we find that in the first several verses, beginning with verse 20. Daniel says, While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom, had, who, whom I had seen in the, previous, in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of evening 
offering. All right, so let's just dig in real quickly on these couple of verses. Notice, while I was speaking, praying, confessing, presenting, Daniel has been in an extended time of prayer. If you remember back at the very first, not only has he been in an extended time of prayer, he is in sackcloth and ashes, he's fasting, and, and so he is beginning to wear down. Now, I'm thinking this prayer service that Daniel's having is probably not just uh, something that I do, maybe 30 or minutes to an hour in the morning if I'm lucky and I can focus long enough. Enough. And I'm sure all of you do much better than I do when it comes to that. But anyway, I'm sure his is an extended time of prayer. He is on his face. He is pleading with God. He is ignoring food and the necessities of the body. And he has taken a position of humility with a sackcloth and ashes before God. And he is crying out to God on behalf of his people. And he's doing it, and he's continuing to do it. He's still praying. He's still speaking. He's still confessing. And while that is going on then, he says, Gabriel comes in. So I imagine there's a good possibility that Daniel maybe is even prostrate. Prostrate. I knew I was going to do that. Prostrate on his face, praying to God. And, and Gabriel comes in. Now he says he's seen this Gabriel in the vision Previously, what that in the, in the Hebrew that that actually is speaking of the vision back in Daniel chapter seven. Um, it's not necessarily speaking of a vision that he's had presently, um, because there's no vision mentioned except here in a few moments, and we'll try to take a look at that when it arrives. But anyway, he goes on then, verse twenty-two, and he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, "Oh Daniel, I've come forth to give you insight and understanding." At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you have, are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. All right, so here's the vision. What vision is he talking about? Before I get there, I want to notice these words to give heed. You recall back in uh, chapter 9, in verse 2, Daniel was talking about how he observed, and that's the word here, uh, in the books, the number of years. All right, so he's noticing and he is interpreting. I want you to notice this because this is important. Daniel's interpreting Bible prophecy when he's looking at Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 25. He's, he's teaching us how to interpret Bible prophecy. See, a lot of churches won't touch Bible prophecy because they say it's controversial, and it is. I mean, there's no doubt you get in these arguments, in a good sense of the word argument, about what the 70 weeks means, and it, there's some controversy. Uh, and there are some people who don't uh, handle it very kindly either. But um, he is teaching us here how to interpret Bible prophecy. And what Daniel saw in the prophecy of Jeremiah was that when Jeremiah said there were going to be 70 years of captivity, you know what that 70 years meant? It meant 70 years. Okay, so there's, we need to be careful when we approach Bible prophecy. So he, Gabriel comes in and says to Daniel, I want you to take your mind off of the Jeremiah 25 prophecy and I want you to observe or as it says here, give heed, it's the same Hebrew word, give heed to this message that I'm bringing to you and gain understanding of the vision. What vision is he talking about? Well, obviously we have to have some controversy here because there's no vision mentioned other than here uh, and, and what Daniel just said in, in the, the previous couple verses uh, of a vision that he's looking at or has seen during this extended time of prayer. So there are uh, several different ways to take this. Possibly, um, I th well, I'll just put it this way. I think he's talking about the vision of Daniel chapter 7. Because um, when Daniel says he had seen Gabriel in the vi previous vision or the vision previously, it's speaking of at the beginning or, or at another date and time. So I believe what, what Gabriel's pointing to here is that uh, vision that Daniel had in chapter 7. We're not going to go back and look at that, but you remember it dealt with the little horn and all of that. All right? So, that brings us then to the purpose of the 70 weeks, and this is where we're going to camp out this morning. We're not going to get to verses 25 through 27. We want to look at these verses in particular. All right? 
And so Daniel writes, or actually he's writing what Gabriel says to him. He says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So we have six infinitives that are given to us here that we're going to look at in just a moment that lay out this program, and they are the purposes that uh, are presented for this, uh, this period of time that uh, Gabriel is going to speak of here in just a moment. So what do we find? Well, some say that this 70 weeks is going to be fulfilled during the Maccabean times. In other words, during that Maccabean revolt, that's the intertestamental period. You know, there are those 400 years where there's no revelation from God. God is silent. But we do have some pretty accurate historical information in the, in the book of the Maccabees. There, I think there are a couple of them, maybe more. That's not my area. But uh, a lot of the people believe that this prophecy was fulfilled during the Maccabean time. And what happened during that time? Well, that's when Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, came in and destroyed Jerusalem. You recall that? We talked about that a few weeks ago. And so a lot of people are going to say, well, that was when all of this was fulfilled. Well, there are some real serious problems with that. Hopefully I'll remember to address those problems as we walk through here. Some say the whole thing is symbolic. Uh, that just doesn't wash. Um, it, it, when Daniel looks at the prophecy of Jeremiah, it's not symbolic. Those 70 years of captivity, it's not symbolic. It is very precise. Uh, down to the day when, when uh, the decree was given for the Jews to begin to head back home. Um, and so to say that this is symbolic is simply uh, to avoid addressing the issue. And because Daniel understood Jeremiah's 70-year prophecy as literal years, then we need to understand this prophecy as something literal. All right, so... We need to understand, first of all, what does he mean by 70 weeks? Is that what it literally means? Well, the uh, shivi'im is the Hebrew word for 70, okay? And it's taken from the Hebrew word shavua, which means a week. It's really simple. And so you put, to t put the two together. As a matter, matter of fact, that shavua in Hebrew is actually in the plural. So it's 70 weeks, okay? 70 sets of seven. And so, really simply put, the meaning is, is 70, uh, uh, 490 years when you, when you do the math. And I stay away from math like it's a plague. But anyway, or COVID. But anyway, um, so what is the meaning? Well, the words are always determined. And you could go through and you look at the Hebrew words and, and see how they're used in different places. And what we find is that it's always determined by its context. And so we can look at Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 and 3, because here are, is the only place, uh, only other place in the Bible where these phrases are used. And there's something interesting that Daniel does here. In verse 2 of chapter 10, Daniel says, In those days I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. But there's something missing here in the English trans translation. Because Daniel doesn't just say three weeks. He literally says three weeks of days. Yamim. He adds that at the end. It's not necessary. I mean, think of it. Is Daniel saying, I fasted for, you know, uh, 21 years? No. He fasted for 21 days. Anybody... Anybody could understand it. But what Daniel does is he emphasizes that it was 21 days. He adds that to that. Why does he do that? It's quite possible that he does that to help distinguish what he's speaking of in chapter 9. That he's dealing with 70 weeks of years or 490 years total. All right? Does that, does that make sense? Okay, I see a couple of you. Agreeing. Okay, great. So, very simply, when Daniel says 70 weeks have been decreed for your people, 
what he's saying that there are 490 years. You, uh, even I can do that math. 70 times 7 is 490. All right? I should be getting applause for that, that I actually did the math. Okay. All right. Okay, so we've already looked at this, but literally what Daniel says is, I had been mourning for three entire weeks of days. And uh, I had not used any ointment until the entire three weeks of days were completed. All right? So, 70 times 7 is 490. All right, so here's what we have then. You see Daniel's day right there in the middle. This is where he is in the midst of this 70 years captivity actually coming down to the end of it. But if we go back, why were they in that 70 years of captivity? It was because of the sabbatical years that had been violated. So there were 490 years in the past that Israel had neglected to obey God when it came to the sabbatical years. But what we're finding out then is that in Daniel's day, he's being given this prophecy that in the future there are still 490 years remaining. And what we're going to get into next week is when do those 490 years begin? Well, it's going to begin when Israel, when the decree to build the, uh, the city uh, is given. And so we'll get into all of that detail next week, Lord willing. All right, so we move on then. Verse 24, he keeps on and says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Well, what does it mean, decreed? And you think, well, it just means that there's been a statement made. And it, yeah, in English it does, and in Hebrew it can. But what that word decreed is, it's from a Greek word, excuse me, Hebrew word, chatak, and it literally means to cut, or it can mean to demarcate, or to impose um, and so when he says they've been decreed, what he's saying is that God has set aside or demarcated this amount of years for something to take place in Israel. And so you can see the King James Version, the New King James Version, the New English Translation, all translate this have been determined. That's a good translation also. But I really like this idea of demarcate. Because that's what he's saying here, that God has set off this. It's like he's put, put a guard around these 490 years for Israel to go through this time. And we'll get to the details next, next week. And so he's saying that although the 70 years is about over, yes, you're about to be released from your captivity, there, are still, uh, there is still another period of time that has been marked off by God for him to deal specifically with Israel concerning certain things. And so what are those certain things? Well... First of all, who is the audience? Notice who his audience is. Who are, when he says to Daniel, your people, who's he speaking of? Jews? Israel. Right. So this is the target audience, not the church. This is very important for us to remember. This time period that he's marked out is not for the church. It's for Israel and for specific purposes. All right, so what's the intended location? Your holy city. What city is that? Jerusalem, exactly. All right. So he's identified his target audience and where the focal point of these 490 years are going to occur. So it's the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. All right. So what is the intended outcome? What result is God looking for here uh, in this period of time? Well, he tells us very, very clearly. First of all, it's to finish transgression. All right. This is uh, the, the, the grammar here. Is, this is in a causative sense. He is going to cause the transgressions of Israel to be completed or be brought to an end. Now, let me ask you something. When in, in uh, you know, I can't remember the year, uh, but when the Maccabees uh, had to face Antiochus, when he came in and destroyed the city, did that bring an end to the sin of the people of Israel? The simple answer is no. They continue in sin just like the rest of us do. We have to deal with it. They have to deal with it. Okay? Uh, and in this sense, it's a complete cessation. 
So, in a sense, we, because we are believers in Jesus Christ, there is a sense in which this new man does not ever sin, 1 John. But this old man still has a problem. I still have to deal with sin. So there's that internal conflict, right? This is not talking about that. This is talking about a complete termination of sinfulness. So this obviously did not happen in the days of Antiochus. This did not happen in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed by Rome. It is a date that is set for a future time. But I don't want to, we won't get too deep into that, all right? So he wants to finish transgression. Well, we looked at the idea of transgression last week, but it literally means re to rebel. So the transgression is referring to Israel's rebellion against God in chasing after other gods and things of that nature. Well, he also says that it's going to, well, I forgot the other points, didn't I? All right, so I've, I've just said all of that. You don't need me to go over it again. All right. All right, so he says then that he's going to make an end of sin. That the, the word there for make an end means to seal up or to set a seal upon. And so think of it this way. When a contract was written out or a letter was completed, something like that, uh, they would roll up the scroll and they would put a seal on it. So it's a done deal. There it is. Bam. And so the seals put on, that's what we get the picture of here. All of that sin of Israel is going to be rolled up and sealed away. It's done. It's a done deal. There's no more, okay? Uh, and this idea next then, uh, where the 70 weeks are going to be a metaphorical seal like that on a deed, on a title deed. The atonement, what does he mean by atonement? Literally to expiate. Uh, and it means to make amends. Um, and this atonement is going to come in the person of the Messiah. And so Jesus Christ is the one who's going to make this atonement. Then he goes on. Let me point out something real quick, though. These, these six um, infinitives that he gives us here, three of them are dealing with sin, the other three are dealing with the righteousness of God, as you just got a peek at just then, where he says he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. The word for righteousness, uh, it means justice. It means righteousness. And what is the big, uh, the big phrase nowadays? It's not just justice. It's social justice. It's environmental justice. Can I tell you something? And maybe you'll look at me and say, well, that is awfully simplistic, Pastor. And it's only because I'm a very simple person. There's, there's justice and there's injustice. And justice is dealing with person to person or person to God. Okay? So if you're a different shade of melanin than I am and I treat you poorly, that's not injustice. That's wrong. But it's not injustice. It's sin. Now, if, I have, if I'm a police officer and I arrest you for doing nothing, that's injustice. But the knife cuts both ways. Okay? There's no such thing as environmental justice. There's uh, taking care of the environment. There's... Uh, you know, not polluting your water. There's not polluting your air, things like that. But all of these are Marxist phrases that are used to beat you into submission to a worldview that is not biblical. God promised that uh, seed time and harvest, that the summer heat and the winter cold, all of that would continue in perpetuity just as he's designed it, until he brings it to an end. And how's he going to bring it to an end? Global warming. Because <laughs> Peter said he's going to burn it all up. Don't blame me, I'm just the messenger. All right? So we have justice, righteousness. And then he says it's going to be olam. What does that mean? Everlasting, eternal unceasing. Do we see that today? No, we don't. And this, again, pushes this prophecy into the yet future. 
All right? And then he goes on and says, not only is he going to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, again, the, the idea of righteousness has to deal with God's view of what's right and wrong. Okay? We need to make sure we understand that. Because we don't view right and wrong appropriately. Even as Christians, we have a hard time sometimes viewing righteousness as God sees it, okay? Anyway, so not only is he going to bring in everlasting righteousness, he's going to seal up vision and prophecy. Here's that phrase again. What's that mean? He's, it, it's kind of like, again, rolling up the scroll and putting a seal on saying it's all done. All the visions uh, and prophecies that I've given, it's all completed. I've brought it to its end, all right? He goes on then. He says, to anoint the most Holy, And here again is another controversy. What does he mean by the most holy? Some people say, well, that's in, in reference to Jesus when he came. It's uh, the anointing of the Messiah. And that's not at all what it, what it means. The, the, the Hebrew literally says the holy of holies. What is that reference to? The temple, exactly. That holiest place within the temple veil. Of course, the veil's been torn in two, but regardless, there is the Holy of Holies, and that is what he's speaking of. So it's referring to a rebuilt temple. And in this sense, and again, another controversial topic, this is going to be the millennial temple. The, when Christ comes to reign on this earth for a thousand years, which is, as, as uh, J.B. Hickson puts it, it's the front porch of eternity. Uh, that kingdom is going to last forever, but it's going to begin here on this earth, and there's going to be a temple there, and it's going to be anointed, the Holy of Holies, just like it was uh, uh, laid out in the Levitical uh, guidelines. So here's the summary then. Let me go back. I want to read this again. So in verse 24, he says, 70 weeks have been decreed. They have been demarcated. They've been set aside for your people, Israel, for your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish transgression, that's to, to, to get rid of the rebellion, to make an end of sin, to make atonement, or to, 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 to uh, uh, cover over, to do away with the iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. All of this language is pointing to a time when sin is going to be gone and righteousness and holiness and all of the things given to us in biblical prophecy is all going to be brought to its final completion. And those are some good days that we're looking forward to. And this is what Daniel was looking forward to. He was thinking, all right, it's, it's about here. And yet Gabriel says, well, before you get there, God has marked off another time for Israel. So just summarize. So God's marked off 490-year period for the purpose of disciplining Israel. Okay? That language not used here, but we know from elsewhere in Scripture that's what's going to happen. God is still going to be disciplining Israel for sin. But it's not going to stop there. God is going to bring in his everlasting righteousness and actually fulfill completely all of the prophecies and things that were promised to Israel. Now, this idea of disciplining for the number of days or years of disobedience or some action is a pattern that God has used a number of times throughout Scripture. Uh, we're not, and, and so you can, you can look up these uh, passages uh, when you have an opportunity. We're not going to look at them now. But this is a pattern that God has repeated over and over again, where Israel has done something for so many days or so many years, and he disciplines them in a matter that is congruent with that length of time. All right? Also, the outcome of this period for Israel is the fulfillment of God's promises to them. We can find that in the book of Isaiah. And I do want to turn there very quickly in Isaiah chapter 51 in particular. Uh, and you can go elsewhere. You can see the other passages there. And there are more than that, but there are a few just to deal with. But in Isaiah 51 in verses 6 and 8, uh, this is, this is a, a, a prophecy to Israel to, 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 to be kind of like, hey, buck up, 
camper. Uh, this, this is good stuff that's coming. And so he says, lift up your eyes to the sky, then look to the earth beneath, for the sky will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not wane. Verse 8, then he says, for the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool, but my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. And then again in chapter 53, verses 10 and 11. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, speaking of Christ, putting on him, uh, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Again, all speaking of the removal of Israel's sins and the fulfillment of the promises that God has given to them. Now, as we walk over into the New Testament, we see that Paul uses this scenario to encourage church age believers. So you remember in Romans, you go Romans 1 through 8, Paul talks about the mercies of God because that's how he picks up chapter 12. I, I beseech you, or I plead with you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living, holy sacrifice which is acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship, right? Um, but in, in chapters 1 through 8, he lays out the, the sinfulness of man, and then he lays out how that sin is dealt with. And then at the end of chapter 8, he, he begins chapter 8, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he says, you want to know how I know that? And he, he takes us to chapters 9, 10, and 11. What does he deal with there? Israel's past, Israel's present, and Israel's future. 9, 10, and 11. And what did we find there? We find there that God was disgusted with Israel, and so he is punishing them. He has disciplined them. Uh, and, and, uh, but even after all of that disappointment that Israel brought in, uh, in their, into their relationship with God, what do we find? Well, we find this as a matter of encouragement. Do you want to know if you're saved forever when you believe in Jesus Christ? Just look at the nation of Israel. Because God says, I'm going to fulfill my promises to them just as I gave them, despite the fact that they've been a rebellious little snot of a nation most of their lives. Just like you and I, most often, if you would be honest, are rebellious little snots as Christians. Thank you. I'm not alone. Thank you, Lord. So what do we find in Romans? Well, chapter 11, beginning in verse 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial, partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Who is all Israel? Go back to chapter 2 of Romans, uh, around verse 28. He tells us who all Israel is. It, all Israel is not composed of simply people who are born of Abraham. It, 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 it refers to those Jews who have put their faith in their Messiah. Those who have been circumcised in the heart. That's all Israel. doesn't mean that when Christians believe in Jesus, we become spiritual Jews. I've had that thrown in my face before. That's not true. At the whole context is speaking of the, the Jewish people. But he says here, all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and following. He will remove the ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That's the promise. He's going to take away their sins. Well, guess what? We've already got that. We've already obtained the promise. They're still waiting. When I put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior, He saved me. He took away my sins. He gave me His righteousness, and the same is true for you. But they're still waiting. From the standpoint of the gospel, they, speaking of Israel, are enemies for your sake, Mr. Gentile. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the Father. 
For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now, let me just stop here for a second because I used to have a pastor who would say, well, that's referring to your spiritual gifts and your abilities that God has given. That he's given them to you, and so they're irrevocable. Sorry, bud, that's not what it, at all what he's talking about. The gifts and the calling, the calling of Abraham, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the gifts that God has promised them, they're irrevocable, he says. They're going to be given to them. It's just not yet. Well, guess what? When we put our faith in Jesus Christ and it says, whoever believes in him has, present tense, eternal life, you and I sitting here today, having put our faith in Christ, we have eternal life. It's our possession. It's not something we're waiting for. We don't get to experience all the great things that are involved with that yet, but we have that. And though that gift of life eternal, which is used elsewhere outside of this context, is an everlasting gift. If you can lose everlasting life, is there an oxymoron in there somewhere? Everlasting life is something that lasts forever, just like the promises God has made to Israel. Going on then, for just as you uh, once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may be shown mercy. So, Yes, Daniel is thinking that the time has come. And Gabriel comes in and says, well, Daniel, you're partially right. Yes, all those promises are going to be fulfilled, but just not yet. And the same is true for us. There's coming a day when we are called to heaven. We, we see that as the idea of the rapture, the, the harpazo, as Paul calls it in 1 Thessalonians chapter Four, the great snatching away of the church when God calls his, or when Jesus calls his bride to come home. And so just as Israel is still waiting for all of those promises to be fulfilled for them, you and I are waiting for that day when Jesus Christ calls us home and we will shed ourselves of this old body and receive that new glorified body and we will spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father. So we look forward to that day, just as Israel continues to look forward. Now, obviously, most of them are not looking forward with the correct mindset, but those promises are going to be fulfilled, and we can rest assured that the promises God has given to us will be fulfilled. Some of those promises we've talked about a thousand times before, like the idea of not having to be anxious for anything. In Philippians chapter uh, 4, be anxious for nothing, right? But instead, take everything to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So we have that promise that we don't have to sit around and suffer anxiety for anything. There's also the promise that uh, uh, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And we are safe. And there's no condemnation against us who put our faith in Jesus Christ. And we have the promise that God takes all things, regardless of their character, good, be they good or bad, God puts them all in this great big mixing bowl and comes out with the best chocolate chip cookies. God causes all things to work together for the good of those who are called. So we have promises that we can hang our hat on. We can rest assured are true and will be fulfilled. But there are some of us maybe here today who've never put your faith in Jesus Christ where there's some promises for you too. And the main one is this. If you die being separated from God, because that's what sin does. It puts up a separation between us. As the Magahas were speaking this morning in Sunday school, that, that idea that we're separated from God, it's a chasm that we can't breach ourselves. But Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, has done it for us. He became a human being. He walked on this earth a perfect life. And he paid the debt for our sin when he hung on the cross and died and was buried. But on that third day, he rose again. He's now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he offers to you a salvation already paid for. 
if you will just put your faith in him and then you can receive the promise of eternal life. You can receive the promise that your sins are gone and you have his righteousness on your account. If you've never done that, I plead with you to do that today. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that we've handled it correctly this morning. If I've said anything that distracted or, or was uh, wrong, Lord, I pray that you help us to correct that. And Father, as we leave this place, we pray that you would help us to, to be zealous, uh, to be excited uh, and willing and bold enough to share the gospel with those who need to hear it. And may we live in a way that brings you glory. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. We pray that you help us love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen.